Clinton from Trinity in Cheyenne. Um, welcome to the 13th annual Tell the Good News About Jesus Convocation. Um, the theme, as you've probably seen all over our promotional materials, is what is truth? That question that Pilate asked, uh, somewhat perhaps rhetorically, of our Lord Jesus Christ, exploring the topic of truth, what is the nature of truth, and so forth. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. The Reverend Dr. Matthew Richard, he is a, you're a pastor at, uh, is it Gwinner, North Dakota? All right, just recently colloquized in the Missouri Synod from the, uh, what was the name of the church body? The Lutheran Brethren, which is a, a, something of a pietistic church body, so um, he has found his way to confessional Lutheranism. He has also written extensively on the topic of truth. Um, in philosophy, we, we call it by the name epistemology, which is just a fancy way of saying, you know, how we come to know things. So he was, he's quite uh, ably gifted for this topic. Um, he's also a blogger. He, he contributes to the Brothers of John the Steadfast blog, and he also has his own blog called PM Notes. We can put links up um, on our uh, Tell the Good News About Jesus Facebook page. Pastor Richard? Uh, we're going to be talking about the implications of truth and um, I think first just want to share just a little bit of my background because that's always kind of good to do, kind of connect, you know, get this connection between um, each of us here as we ponder this idea. All right, let's see if this works here. There we go. All right. As uh, Pastor Hinton said, I'm from uh, Gwinnett, North Dakota. How many of you are familiar with Bobcat, the Bobcat machinery? Okay. I didn't know this. I've been in Gwinnett for about two months now. I uh, received a call there uh, this last November. And it turns out that this small town of Gwinnett, which has about 800 people, has a huge plant that employs about 1,500 people uh, that work and manufacture bobcats. And so um, the town of Gwinnett, like I said, is about 850 people. But we have this plant right in the very center of the uh, city. and. Uh, it employs some 1,500 people. So that's where I'm from. On the uh, side there, that's my family, my wife Serenity, and my daughter Anya, who was the one who graciously gave me this cold this last week, and my son Matthias. And uh, so we're just loving it. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I colloquized into the Missouri Senate from the Church Lutheran Brethren. I was uh, a pastor for 10 years in the Lutheran Brethren. Uh, very, very humble to be a part of the Missouri Senate, and very, very humble to be here in your midst uh, to share on such an important topic here. I had a professor that once said to me, uh, he would come to class and he would say to us, gentlemen, um, the topic we're going to cover today is like drinking from a fire hydrant. And he said, you know, the, 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 the amount of material that we have and the stuff we're going to cover is just so much stuff, it's going to be attempting to make you drink from a fire hydrant. And so then he would give us some suggestions and he would say, suggestions how to do that. I'm going to kind of give you the suggestion that he gave me. He said, drink fast. <laughs> Now, I'll be very honest with you, this material that we're going through, there's going to be a lot of it. Um, there's, there's going to be a lot to cover, and I'm going to throw a lot at you. And so as I was preparing this, I thought to myself, well, I can either go real light or I can go on the heavy side. And I thought, well, I'll go on the heavy side with the risk of maybe overwhelming you just a little bit. But how we can offset that is please ask questions. So as we go here, um, if something doesn't make sense, just raise your hand and we'll stop everything and we'll take care of it. Because most likely, if you have a question, somebody else will have the same question too, okay? All right? So we'll go through it <clears throat> little by little here. And so we'll stop and take breaks and, and handle any questions that you might have and so forth. All right, any questions so far? <laughs> All right. Um, one other note too. Uh, the material that I'm going to be going over, I'll be posting it. I'll try to get it up to my blog tonight or tomorrow. Uh, those are the addresses for my blog. Uh, it's pastormatrichard.com or pastormatrichard.org. Uh, either one will get it there. And I believe it will be also to, the, um, to the, the, the district, page two. Is this one working or is it mainly this one here? It's, it's the law that's on. All right. seems like when I move my, vo when I move my head here, it, uh, I'll try to speak into it there to keep it consistent for you, okay? All right, so what are we covering, covering here? In this first part we're going to be covering is we're going to be covering an overview of the subject of truth and its powerful repercussions upon the three dimensions of worldview, okay, 
And we're going to cover what that is, language and emotions. Okay? So one more time, <clears throat> we're going to cover an overview today, this afternoon, on the subject of truth and its powerful repercussions. And trust me, the issue of truth and the subject of truth has tremendous, tremendous power and tremendous amount of influence over the realms of worldview and our language and our emotions. So the question that we have, is truth and knowledge really that powerful? I think maybe we, we live in a day and age where we've heard this from uh, Pastor Rick Warren down in Saddleback Church. Uh, he said that, talked about the Reformation of the 1500s be a Reformation of creeds, and he was talking about how now we need a Reformation of deeds. And uh, it seems to me that this quote by uh, St. Francis, Francis of Assisi, you know the quote I'm talking about, it actually wasn't a, a quote that he said. It's attributed to him, though, the quote that says, Preach the gospel, and if you have to, what? Use words. Indeed, we're in a time and a context where there's a real huge emphasis on deeds and actions. And so there's a sense where I've noticed, at least to a certain extent, that there's a diminishing of truth. But trust me, when it comes to truth, it is truth that is in the driver's seat. It is truth that does the forming. It is truth that actually shapes and forms emotions and actions and so forth. Okay? So, I'll give you a little example here. <clears throat> this is uh, an example that's not original with me. I've, I've seen several other people use it before. And it's an introduction here on thinking about, uh, we have basically eight letters here, right? What does the note say? I love you, right? It's a note. And here's the story, okay? A wife discovers a handwritten note in her husband's coat. She's doing the laundry, probably, or uh, putting his coat away that he left on the floor, right? And she looks, well, it's true, that's, that's, that's what I do, I leave my coat, and, all right, so she finds a note, right, and she takes it out, and it's in a, woman's, in a woman's handwriting, and it's eight little letters, and it says what? I love you, okay? What are the implications of these three simple words? <coughs> Think about that. What are the implications of these three simple words here? I love you. It's drastic, isn't it? Well, we have to ask the implications. Well, it depends, right? Who's the note from? And who's the note for? And is it true? Well, if the note is maybe from the daughter, let's just say the husband and wife, their daughter was home from college, and she decided to leave a note in her dad's coat, and she took off. Maybe he just got done dropping her off at the airport. He wrote the note, I love you, and put it in his coat pocket. So if it comes to find out, the wife finds out it's from the daughter, then what does that implication do for her view of reality? The husband is what? A great father, right? It, it creates a sense of, of you know, value and a sense of, of uh, confidence in the wife, thinking, man, you know, I, you know, husband is a really good father, and that daughter of ours, she just loves him to death, right? Here's another one. What if the note is from the husband's mother? Okay, now that depends, right? <laughs> right? It depends what the wife's relationship is with her mother-in-law, right? What if it is from another woman? He's in trouble. He's in trouble. More than trouble, right? Those eight letters, the implication that those eight letters, if they're from another woman, are going to change how she feels, how she views what? marriage, how she understands the word love, right? How she understands the promise of vows, right? Okay? What if it was just picked up as trash, okay, on the floor? The implications of that. Or maybe it was from the daughter for the mother, right? And maybe they were at the airport and the daughter said, hey, dad, give this to mom, right? So the implications, I, I wanted to use this example <clears throat> to show you the implications of truth. Can we all agree that truth does have a huge and tremendous, I guess you would say, force on the way that we can view things, the way that we talk, our emotions? So indeed we would say that truth is powerful, and uh, there we go, the note will either strengthen or bring into question the status of the marriage. Okay? The note will either strengthen or bring into question the wife's view okay, of the marriage. The note will dictate the wife's emotions. 
whether the wife will be angry or happy or whether, uh, with her husband. The note will shape how she speaks about her husband in marriage, either positively or negatively. The three simple words on the note will impact the way the wife sees reality, the way that she feels, and the way that she talks. So thus we can say, without a doubt, that truth is what? Very, very powerful. Okay? So what we're going to be doing now, <clears throat> this is just an overview of what we're going to be covering today and this evening and tomorrow. We're going to work our way through this little diagram here. And this will be, like I said, I'll put this on my blog and we'll get this on the uh, district uh, website here too. <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Um, but when we look at this, I want us to, we're going to start here with the very bottom. See if this works. There we go. We're going to start with truth. And Pastor Dan um, Hinton said that what we call that is this fancy word epistemology. And don't, don't let that word, um, you know, confuse you at all. It's just basically the idea of how do we come about knowing what truth is. Okay? So it's the study of epistemology. is the study of how we acquire truth and how we source truth. Okay? And then from truth, the next level... Okay, this is the foundational level. Then we're going to go up to a lens, or you've maybe heard of the word worldview. How many of you have heard of the word worldview world before? And that's fairly common. And you know, believe it or not, when it comes to worldview, that you know, most people understand worldview, have talked about worldview, but there's really another dimension below it, and that's truth. Okay, and we're going to get into this a little bit later. How truth actually uh, serves as dictating how that worldview, that lens, sees things, and I'll explain that a little bit later. So at a very foundational level, we have truth, and then we have the lens, and that flows out of truth, okay? And then from the lens and truth, we have what? Language, and we have feelings. So just off the top of your head, what are the, out of these four, what are the two that you most likely see in everyday life? What are the most visible? Yeah, right here, feelings and language. Lenses and the truth, how we acquire truth, typically happen what? Subconsciously, okay? They happen without us even realizing it. So one of the attempts of this convocation here in this subject is to help you reflect on and even looking for yourself and understand how do I acquire truth, okay? Because we all do it, okay? Okay, so let's jump into this. We're going to look at the very bottom here, okay? I'm going to try to use the same icons. So right here, we're going to be looking just at this. Okay, so how do you know what you know? Anybody have any suggestions there? How do we know what we know? This is what we call is the study of epistemology, or the study of truth. How do we know what we know? Okay, everyone, okay, that includes you and includes me, we attempt to gather truth in various ways from various sources. So we acquire truth through different ways, okay, and from different sources. And this often is done subconsciously. It happens intuitively. Okay? The gathering of truth is typically done to answer fundamental, okay, and I'll explain this to you, ontological questions such as the existence of God, the meaning of being human, and the nature of truth and reality. Now when I say ontology, that's just basically the study of being. Okay? We ask these questions of truth to understand who we are, why we're here, right? And by the way, the scriptures do supply all the answers for this for us. But we're looking for truth to answer the questions, who am I, my context, how do things run the way that they run, okay? To make sense of life, okay? So my point here is that this happens oftentimes, and I would say the majority of the times, it happens what? Subconsciously. Okay? So, we're going to look at some examples of how, okay? Not the sources, but how we attempt to know truth, okay? So, the first one is this, is authority. So, one of the ways that we can know what we know, so if I were to ask you, how do you know what you know, then one of the ways we would say is, well, I know because what? Albert Einstein told me, right? Because the pastor told me. Because the teacher told me, right? Or because the what? The doctor told me, okay? We have authority, okay? And I think I heard somebody say the Bible. We're going to get to that. That would be a different category. But the Bible is an authority, okay? We could also put it up there. We, we could put it as an authoritative person, be God, of course, right? 
Okay? But this is one way <clears throat> when you ask somebody a question, how do you know what you know? Well, um, they'll appeal to a sense of an authority told me. Okay? Does that make sense? So this is just one of the ways that we know what we know, how we acquire truth. Okay? Now, we're going to go through these. There's about six or seven of these, and some of these are good and some of these are bad, okay? and we use all of them, and we'll get to um, how that all works here in a moment. Okay. Next one, how do I know? Conventional wisdom. I know because nearly everyone in my family, community, church, and city thinks so. Conventional wisdom is just basically, well, how do you know that to be true? And many times people respond, well, doesn't everybody think that's true? Right? Okay. That's almost, that's almost like the uh, common sense approach. How do you know that to be true? Well, everybody in my city, we, we all agree with that, don't we? Right? Okay. So what is the appeal to what? Authority. The next one is an appeal to what? How do we know what we know? By conventional wisdom. Next one, how do we know what we know? This one's called empiricism. And this is basically, I know because many studies, they use very large samples of a total population of people who have this disease, confirm a high statistical correlation between salt intake and aggravation of this disease. In other words, this empiricism is tied to, basically, we know what we know because we've tested it, right? And we've seen the evidence, and we've seen the proof, the, the, we've seen the proof in the pudding, right? So if you ask somebody, how do you know what you know? Well, we tested it, we had a thesis, we tested it, we found evidence, and it's proven to be true, scientifically. Okay? Is track with me here, making sense so far? So we have, let's back up here. How do we know? Authority, right? Authoritative figure told us. Next one is conventional wisdom. Well, it's just kind of common sense. Everybody believes it to be true. Empiricism, how do I know it to be true? Well, most recent study just did a study and they proved it. And we see that on TV, don't we? Right? Next one, how do I know what I know? Logic and reason. So here's an example. I know because since A was greater than B and B was greater than C, I concluded that A was greater than C. That's just real simple logic, right? Okay? I see heads nodding, so I see that everybody's tracking with me. That's good. All right, next one I think is probably, in my humble opinion, is probably the most dangerous. Uh, mysticism. Mysticism is, I, I sorry, but I, I can't stand mysticism. <laughs> I think it's because it's part of my ingrained nature of what I grew up with. How do I know what I know? I know because of the spiritual connection that I had with God through my inward contemplation and my self-surrender to Him, I experience God. Okay? Mysticism is really a turning inward to self, right? A turning inward to self, and it's in these caverns of the deep heart that we know what we know. Just a little side note and a little bit of a, um, I guess you would soapbox. I always tell people we, we don't look inside for our shirts, we what? We look outside, right? Extra nose, Christ outside of us, right? Okay? So mysticism, how do I know what I know? Well, I experienced it in my inward emotions or my inward feelings, right? Okay? Next one, observation. How do I know what I know? I know because I was there and I saw it for myself. Makes sense, right? How do I know what I know? Well, I was there, I witnessed and I saw it for myself. And I think we have, yep, we have three more, okay? How do I know this one? Pragmatism. Have you guys heard of this one before? How do I know? I know because I welded it up that way in my shop. I tried it on the field and it has never failed me since. Right? In other words, it must be true because it works and produces the results that we see that we see that are needed. Okay? So how do we know it's true? Well, it, it's true because it works. Right? Okay? All right. <clears throat> How do I know what I know? And this is the one that I uh, mentioned earlier. Somebody said the, bi uh, the Bible. How do I know what I know? And this one is key. Revelation. I know because the Bible tells me so. 
or thus saith the Lord. Okay? And we're going to come back to focus on this, that this is, and I love this word, I've been teaching it to my kids, quintessential. Okay? It's a fun word to say, isn't it? Quintessential. It's the most perfect view, right? The, 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 most, the greatest out of all of them, the most pierced and the greatest. And this is the quintessential source of our, of, of our knowledge is the what? Revelation of God's word. Okay? Finally, but not least, how do I know what I know? I know because I touched it and it felt hot and it smelled as if something were burning. Senses. Okay? All right. So, <clears throat> everyone here, myself included, we combine several ways of how we know truth. We mash them together, and other times we alternate between them, and this is done implicitly rather than explicitly. In other words, we do this without even knowing it. We bounce back and forth between all of these. And I'm sure there's more we could add to it. Okay? So how do we know truth? We'll bounce back and forth between all of them. And it's not that all of them, and we're going to hit this a little bit, it's not that all of them are bad, okay? Um, some of them provide some very, very, you know, logic. God has given us the gift of, of our minds to use logic and reason, right? But the reality is what I want us to focus on is to be aware of what we're using and how we're coming about our knowledge, okay? Okay, before we move on, any questions? Does this make sense? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> these are, to be honest, what, what we're actually covering is on my um, research for my uh, major applied research project for my doctorate. I, um, I, I've actually surveyed um, over 400 people going from American evangelicalism into Lutheranism. And these are different categories of things that uh, got brought up with all my interviews with them. And so, you know, no scientific method of coming about these. Um, I just put them in alphabetical order, so I, I'm sure I probably missed some. Um, so there probably could be more we could add to the list. So, hope that answers. Yeah, so this main section, what we're covering is, and I can maybe talk about this a little later on, but I, I interviewed 400 American evangelicals coming out of like Baptist church and Pentecostal churches coming into a confessional Lutheranism and we talked about all the shifts that were happening. And real interesting right here. What are you going to guess here? What ones do you think dropped the most that they used within American evangelicalism when it came to Lutheranism? Yep, you hit it. Yep, the one that dropped the most was this. Within American evangelicalism, they depended highly on mysticism. When they came into Lutheranism, I mean, it was demolished. Okay? It was absolutely demolished coming into confessional Lutheranism. And then the other one that went down, what would you guess the other one that went down on? Pragmatism was one, and the other one was what? Yep. Yep, conventional wisdom went way down. So conventional wisdom, mysticism, and pragmatism. What went up when they came into confessional Lutheranism? Revelation. Revelation went up. Not, surprisingly, not a lot. I mean, it did go up. Revelation went up, and which other one went up? Logic. Yeah. Yep. I think Lutherans tend to be, uh, you know, that's revelation and, you know, logic was, was went up too. Okay? Interesting, huh? Okay. So why does this matter? Okay? <clears throat> More specifically, what are your sources of truth? Okay? So we've talked about how we acquire knowledge, right? Okay? But now we're going to ask the question of what? Where do we acquire it from? Okay? So I want to make note of instead of using the term sources of truth, okay, I prefer using the term sources of knowledge for not all of the following examples are what? Valid sources of truth. Some of them provide what? False truth. Okay? So forgive me if I use, you know, source of truth. You know, the only source of truth I would say is going to be what? The Word of God, right? Okay? But, um, so if I, if I mess that up, just keep this in the back of your mind here. Okay. So thus there are effective and ineffective ways of knowing truth as well as true and false sources of what? Truth. Okay. Let's look at some of these here. Uh, what we see up here is one that's a source of knowledge is going to be music 
And believe it or not, music, the lyrics that come through music, we just often pop on our earbuds and we just take it in, right? Hollywood, movies, right? Service sources of truth. Family and friends. Bible, newspaper. Um, this is going to be friends, this is going to be family, church, media outlets, okay? <laughs> Pastor, priest, right? College, instructors, internet, blogging, right? So forth. I mean, we can add to this. We can add a hundred more things to it, I'm sure, easily, okay? So these are <clears throat> sources of knowledge. The other person, average person, is relatively unaware of all the sources of knowledge that shape and form them. We mash several sources of knowledge together, bounce back and forth, etc., receiving and gathering, and, for, and the formation of knowledge happens subconsciously. Just think about this. You know, I'm thinking I got on the plane this morning, looking at all the billboard advertisements, right? Going through the uh, airplane, airport, right? Um, all the different logos on t shirts, right? Okay? All the conversations that were going on, right? It's everywhere. We're bombarded with sources of knowledge everywhere. Okay? So, why is this important to understand how we know what we know as well as what our sources of knowledge are? Now, obviously, we hit this earlier that there are ways of gathering truth and the ways of gathering sources of, of knowledge to answer what we would say are ontological questions. And ontological questions are basically questions of our nature, of our being, of who we are, right? Um, we, we all want to have this idea of the story of what we're in, who we are, where we belong in this world, right? Okay? But there's actually another level that actually is really important for us to understand. It's because truth, it shapes our what? Our lenses. Okay? Oftentimes we talk about worldviews, but this is kind of my contention. We talk about worldviews, but we don't go far enough. We don't back it down to the what? Level of truth. That make sense? So truth serves like a lens prescription. Okay? So I went the other day to the eye doctor, and he said to me, he said to me, Matt, he said, uh, we need to get you progressive lenses. And I said, well, what are progressive lenses? Well, the progressive lenses have these little circles in the bottom. I'm like, well, those are bifocals. And, and I looked at him, I said, is that a politically correct way of saying I need bifocals? And he smiled. And I said, well, I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm not, not that old, but so I ended up getting reading glasses, right? Okay, so you're blurry, but this is clear here, right? <laughs> I thought it's really nice for preaching. I don't know if people are sleeping or what when I'm preaching, so. <laughs> but we think of truth. Truth, in essence, forms like what we would say is a prescription. Okay, that makes sense? A prescription that shapes and forms what? The lens in which we what view life. Okay? Sources of knowledge. Okay, and how we know truth, they form and shape our lenses, they are connected. The sources of truth, the sources of knowledge, and the way we know truth are at the foundation of a person. Like falling dominoes, sources of knowledge and how we know truth have drastic consequences upon lenses, okay? either positively or negatively, depending on the truth claim embraced. So how do these lenses function? Okay, so now that we've covered that we acquire knowledge through different ways, right, and from different sources, right, oftentimes we grab and pick and choose a mixture of these all together, okay, and this idea of truth, how we acquire truth, and the sources of truth that we acquire it from, they shape and form their lenses, but then how do these lenses function? Okay? A lens... Worldview, we would say, is a person's perception of reality. Everyone views the world through a particular lens. These lenses are deep, they're generally unexamined, and they are largely what? Implicit. Like glasses, they shape how we see the world, but we are rarely aware of their presence. In fact, others can often see them better than what? We can see them ourselves. Okay, these lenses, they're like maps or narratives that help us view and understand reality and life. 
Okay? Have you ever, ever encountered that visitor with somebody? They're like, man, they view things really weird. <laughs> right? You're seeing their what? Their worldview. Chances the reason, the reason why they're seeing things differently than you is what? Because they're acquiring different sources of what? Knowledge, right? Sources of knowledge and different what? Means of, of accomplishing that. When we're doing this tonight, especially, what happens when you start visiting with somebody and all of a sudden you realize and you're talking about something but you're both using different words, you know? The same words but kind of different meaning, right? And then somebody goes, oh, we're just saying the same thing and we're just using what? Different words. And then, oh, we can get along, right? <laughs> no. What's happening is there are different worldviews and different sources of truth that are conflicting underneath, right? Okay? But most of us, right, and I'm saying myself included, it's difficult for us to get what? Get beneath that. Okay? As we're going to cover this tonight, when worldviews collide and when words collide and when sources of truth collide, the uh, effect can be very, what, devastating. Okay? All right. Make sense? So, <clears throat> what we need to keep in mind, though, too, is that knowledge and truth and lenses are their, what, interconnected. Okay? So, they're interconnected and they work together. Okay? I want you just to look at that for a second here, and I'm going to explain what this means here, Okay? So you see the arrow of truth going up, influencing the lens, but the lens also comes back and influences what? Truth. So indeed, sources of knowledge and how one knows truth shapes and forms a what? Person's lens. However, keep in mind that a person's lens processes and delivers knowledge back to the what? The person. Keep in mind that a person's knowledge comes through their already pre-existing lens Around and around they go, working together, incorrect and correct truth forms a worldview, but it is through a person's lens that they are what? Informed. So there's the thing called circularity. So it's very tough to break into that. They work together. That makes sense? So truth, as you call it truth, it shapes the way we see things, the way we see things filters it back in, and it, what? When truth comes away, we filter it through our lens back into ourselves. And it goes into what? Circularity. Okay? So, this leads us to ask the question of ourselves, how does the Christian know truth, and what is the Christian source of truth? Okay? What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to turn to this article. You should all have it called the quintessential knowledge source. Does anybody have that? Now these last two paragraphs are the most important, okay? The message of the cross is the Christian's knowledge source in the midst of other knowledge sources. Keep in mind, though, that the theology of the cross does not mean that for a theologian, the church year shrinks together into nothing but Good Friday. Rather, it means that Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost cannot, what, be understood without Good Friday. In other words, it does not mean that conventional wisdom, logic, empiricism, observation, and so forth are completely dismissed or disregarded, but rather it is from the cross that everything is understood because hidden in the cross is the deepest essence of God's revelation. In summary, truth is attached to the person of Christ. The idea of truth stands and falls on Jesus. Truth is what? Christocentric, centered on Christ. However, truth is not only defined by the person of Christ, but truth is also derived from Christ's cross. Truth is also crucicentric. Therefore, Jesus and the salvific cross as expressed in God's holy word are the Christian's quintessential knowledge sources. Indeed, from the words of Herman Sasa, from the cross everything is understood because hidden in the cross is the deepest essence of God's revelation. Okay. Questions? Did I lose you guys? 
So in a nutshell, what, what, what am I saying there in that article? I think that last paragraph covers it. <clears throat> it's not that we don't dismiss logic and other ways of acquiring truth. It's that we understand it in light of what? Christ and his cross. Okay? It is always through revelation, okay, that that defines and helps shape the rest of the way we see things. And that's, yeah, I have a lot of Calvinist friends um, coming out of my background. I have a, I have a good friend, and I don't know why. He calls me, I'm his second favorite Lutheran. Um, I was his first, but I got demoted. Um, but, you know, he, he's a good, good friend. Oh, to who? Uh, uh, by Chris Rosebro. Do you guys know Chris Rosebro, Pirate Christian Radio? Um, anyway, um, I always pick on him, and, you know, if he ever watches this, he'll probably get after me, but he has a lot of Calvinistic leanings, and I always tell him, I said, you know what Calvin uh, goes with, with the magisterial, magisterial versus ministerial use of reason, is that the technical terms, in other words, um, I, I think there's times where Calvin takes what the use of reason and places it over top of Revelation, right, that makes sense? So where we stand as Lutherans is that we what, let revelation stand over top of logic and reason. Okay? All right? So, grab my clicker here. How does the Christian's primary, uh, primary know truth and what is the Christian's source of truth? Answer, how? Primary, revelation. Okay? The source, primarily, God's word. Okay. Now, I want to be very clear. It's not that we dismiss logic, you know, not that we dismiss those other ones, but we see it through what? The eyes of Christ crucified. Okay? So how are we doing time? Good, we're doing grand time. Okay. Now, this is kind of where we kind of, well, we've done that now. Believe it or not, we've done most of the heavy lifting, Okay? I don't think anybody's passed out here, right? I don't think anybody's sleeping at all, right? Okay, so we've done most of the heavy lifting, okay? So now that we've covered, now that we've covered um, knowledge and truth, we've covered lens, right? What comes from these? What comes out of those, I guess I would say? When it comes to language, okay? So words express truth claims and are visible signs of people exercising their own what? Reason. Okay? When we talk, right, when I use words, okay, if I'm going to visit with some of the different gentlemen in my congregation, a lot of them work at the Bobcat factory, I'll ask them how their day is going, and they're going to express with words, okay, what they encountered that day in the context of working at the Bobcat factory, and they're going to express their reason and their intellect and everything else that's going to express from that context of what? Where they worked. So words they express truth claims and are what? Visible signs of people exercising their own reason. The words they capture and express the person's, uh, they capture and express the person. Words express a person's reason. Reason though is embedded in a particular lens and sourced from particular knowledge sources. Words are not, get this, they're not autonomous. Okay? They're not independent, but they have what? Layers of depth behind them and in them. So when we speak, what is behind our words? We have ideas, we have a worldview, a worldview sourced by what? Truth? So, and our faith, yep. Yeah. There's a lot behind words. On the other side, too, we have what? Feelings. What are the implications of sources of knowledge and lenses upon feelings? Likewise, feelings are visible signs. Feelings and behavioral patterns flow out of a person's lens. Feelings emerge either positively or negatively. And what we're going to get into tonight is this. If you have a single event that happens, because if you're thought about this, you have a single event that happens, and you have two different people, one is happy and one is what? Sad. Okay? Why? They have different what? Worldviews. Right? 
We have an event that happens and one speaks positively and one speaks what? Negatively. Why? They have different worldviews. Why do they have different worldviews? Because they're formed by different sources of what? Truth. Okay? So generally speaking, emotions will trend negatively in the event of a cognitive dissonance. Okay, we'll get into that later. And dissymmetry. And they will trend positively in the event of cognitive harmony and symmetry. We'll get into those words later, okay? All right? So both feelings and language are what? Visible signs of a person's lens and visible signs of a person's reason, reason that is embedded in sources of knowledge. Feelings and language are the person's lenses and source of knowledge in what? Action within a specific time, place, and context. They are the what? The tips of the iceberg, if you will. They are the tremors and seismic vibrations of tectonic lenses and tectonic sources of knowledge interacting with different tectonic lenses and different tectonic sources of knowledge. Kind of picking up on the idea of an earthquake, things that happen underneath, right? Okay, so here's what we've learned here. There are, I should maybe say three because these kind of are kind of in the same dimension, I guess. So we'd say that three or four. So there are basically three or four dimensions to be aware of. Feelings and language are at the what? Visible. However, there is always what? Intricate workings occurring at the what? Worldview. And the level where one acquires truth, and we call this the what? Epistemological level. Thus, sources of knowledge have drastic impact on the what? Whole person. So, in the second part tonight, what we're going to look at is we're going to explore the ramifications of what goes on when a person encounters knowledge sources and lenses that are foreign to their truth framework. Indeed, new truth or false truths will cause tremendous amounts of what? Tension and turmoil upon a person's lenses, language, and emotions. In the second session, we'll be looking at how conflict begins, how we defend in conflict, and the result of the conflicts. Okay? So, we have about 10, 15 minutes, 20. Let's uh, open it up for questions, thoughts, feedback, and if we don't, then I guess we can have, well, I'll turn it over to the MC, I guess you could say.